Hey everybody, welcome back to the Mass Retirees Weekly Update. Today's Friday, February 18th. I'm Sean Duhamel. I'm joined this week by two special guests, Association General Counsel Bill Reary and our legislative liaison, Nancy McGovern. What we're gonna do this week is do a, a preview or an overview of the March 2022 um, edition of our newsletter, The Voice, which many of you, by the time you watch this, this video or you read this week's email message, hopefully a number of you, if not most of you, will have the March newsletter, which is right in my hand, in your hands. Um, but we wanted to give just an overview of what it is we wrote about, why these things are important, and just a little bit of background just to help everybody with a deeper understanding of the information that we're sending out to you. Now, The Voice comes out six times a year. It's sent to all of our members. We also have a program where active employees can purchase a subscription to The Voice. It's $20 a year. It gets you all six editions of The Voice, along with our digital communications that come out every Friday. Um, and it's a great resource and tool for those of you who are active employees and you're vested in the retirement systems and you're starting to think about retirement. Uh, we want to be a resource for all of you and provide you with the same great um, you know, resor resourceful information that all of our members have access to. So if you're not yet a member or if you're not yet a subscriber, visit MassRetirees.com. You can find all the information in the right hand margin to become a member or become a subscriber or just learn a little bit more about our newsletter. So I also want to thank before we get going this week, um, two of our tremendous partners, our creative partners, uh, Jim Crone and Jeff Jordan from Chameleon Design Group. Jim and Jeff have been working with us for many years now and they are really the masterminds of helping us put together such a tremendous product um, that, that comes out six times a year. We couldn't do it without their help. You know, we do all of the writing here in-house, but the graphic design and the, the knowledge and the, the artistry that goes into this is all the guys at, at Chameleon. And Jim and Jeff, we can't thank you enough for your partnership and the work you do with us. In addition to Jim and Jeff, uh, we also have fantastic partners at the Union Print Shop Standard Modern, Massachusetts business. We've been working with Standard Modern now for many years. They do a fantastic job of, of printing up our newsletter and the other print materials that you receive from us. Uh, we couldn't do our work without the work that they do down in on the south coast of Massachusetts at Standard Modern. So to Bob and Jennifer and the whole crew down there, thank you uh, for the work you do for us and on behalf of our membership. But with that, let me jump into the content here. You've probably, hopefully by now, picked up a theme uh, that we've had running now for the last six or eight months, really started last summer. And that is that we greatly believe that the, the fantastic success of our public retirement systems, and by success, I mean the work that has been done for a number of decades now of investing your contributions that you paid into the retirement system, along with the taxpayers' contributions, whether it's at the state level with the state and teachers retirement systems or across all of the 102 local retirement boards, our public retirement officials here in Massachusetts have done a tremendous job of investing your money and the returns now really speak for themselves. And we kick things off right on the front page um, with a story about not only what's happening at the state level, but at the local level, PRIM earned 20% for 2021, and it really marks a remarkable decade of success. Over the past 10 years, the state and teacher retirement systems in, in the PRIT fund has gained $70 billion in assets, which is just mind boggling when you talk about those kinds of numbers. And it, it, there's a lot of um, compliments to go around and, and this is really a feel good story when it comes right down to it. It's been very successful and credit goes to state treasurer Deb Goldberg and Michael Trotsky, um, the executive director and chief investment officer of the PRIT fund. And what we're asking for is that that success or a portion of that success be shared with you, the retirees. And earning 20% in 2021 um, exceeds all expectations. The fund assumes an annual rate of return of 7%. So at 20% is nearly three times the assumed rate of return. We believe that it is proper and necessary and should happen that a portion of that success be shared 
uh, with the beneficiaries of the system. And we all, we're all beginning to get a lot of feedback from the local retirement board members as well, who have been following these stories and have done a great job at the local level of investing local retirees' money and are now working on plans to improve COLA benefits at the local level. Um, so thank you for that. And if we can be a resource for anyone out there, please contact us and we'll do everything we can to work with you at the local level. Now, Nancy and I worked on a story, the accompanying story on the front page about the Group Insurance Commission and some of the decisions that are now underway at the GIC. And um, Nancy, give a little bit of background on, on that story, thanks. Sure, so the story regarding the GIC talks about the plan design for the upcoming uh, enrollment period, which will begin uh, in April, May, with implementation for uh, July 1 for the next plan year. Um, <clears throat> when we went to print, uh, the GIC recommendation was that there was not going to be any changes to the co-pays or deductible structure for the plans for the net upcoming plan year. Um, there was an anticipation of a February meeting being held that was pushed off. There'll be two meetings in March. So we'll be providing um, updates on firm details um, about the plan design, as well as they will be voting on the rate uh, for the plans for next year during those March meetings. Um, so make sure you check the website and your weekly emails and the hotline and, and whatnot um, for firm details on, on what that's gonna look like for your July 1 start date. Uh, the article also gives a little bit of an update on the procurement process uh, that is somewhat underway. They're in the planning stages with a release sometime in early spring, or late spring, early summer. Um, and that is to go out to bid for the carriers and the pharmacy benefit managers for another five-year contract, um, which that will imp be implemented in um, 2023. <clears throat> so that's what that story covers. Um, and we're gonna have a lot of information yeah. published as we always do relative to healthcare, a, a huge portion of what we do here at Mass Retirees um, is related to, to healthcare, you know, whether it be, you know, researching healthcare policy and, and being directly involved in the formulation of healthcare policy here in Massachusetts or reporting that information back to you, providing resources to our local retirees through the, our PEC members. I know Nancy and Bill in particular work very closely with our local retiree PEC members uh, to make sure that your voice is heard at the local level. So as we've been reporting, there's potential for a lot of, of changes to be made over the next year to year and a half. Um, so a big part of what we're going to be reporting on, whether it's in the voice or on these in these videos or the Friday updates or our Facebook page is going to be relative to healthcare. So as Nancy said, you know, please pay close attention. And as things happen, we're going to get that information to you. Um, another piece that, that if you look to page three, um, page three of our newsletter is always going to contain um, the calendar of upcoming events. And we have two um, Teletown Hall meetings scheduled right now on Friday, March 25th. We're holding a Teletown Hall meeting with Unicare and their executive director, David Morales. And Unicare, of course, is one of the primary health insurance providers uh, through the state GIC. Uh, there's also a, an article contained in the newsletter that we wrote in conjunction with Unicare about the focus of um, Unicare and other insurance companies on this whole idea of, of whole health and, and wellness and just keeping people healthier. And it goes much further than managing or scheduling doctor's appointments and, and being the middleman between the retiree and healthcare providers. Um, so it's a really interesting concept. It's something that we believe is cutting edge. We have a long history here at Mass Retirees of working with insurers and, and other um, healthcare providers to find innovative ways to, first of all, make sure that our members are receiving the highest quality care possible while keeping those costs affordable for all of you. Um, whether it be working with the GIC to create the first of its kind, a retiree dental plan um, just over 20 years ago now, actually 21 years ago, 
um, working with Sensio to create the IBIS program and make that available um, to public retirees. And we'll be having more to say about some innovations coming through uh, that pl platform in the coming months. And we want to find ways to try to help keep those costs down for folks while, while making you healthier and really improving the quality of life for all of our members. So it's, it's a key function of what we do here. Also contained on, on page three are two updates on our various legislative platforms, one being what's happening here in Massachusetts at the State House on Beacon Hill with the 17 bills that we proposed for this session. And we've also provided an update in terms of the Social Security WEP and GPO situation in Washington, D.C., and some changes that have come about on, on Capitol Hill. Uh, but Nancy, let me shift it back over to you before we get into the WEP and the GPO. Um, we just had, just last week, you and I um, updated our members on our legislative package, so I don't think we need to get deep into that um, again, but what can members expect to find in the newsletter article? Uh, so the article, <clears throat> excuse me, covers um, activity ramping up over in the legislature, um, and it should be noted that the actual state house is going to be open uh, again starting next week, which will be a, a welcome change. We haven't mm -hmm. had an opportunity to step foot over there in, in a couple of years, so that will be exciting. Um, and further on in the bulletin, there's also um, a list of the legislations that were released favorably from the committee. So folks can check um, and refer to that, uh, that I think it's on seven or eight um, further along. So that will give you uh, the list of legislation that we covered last week in last week's video and, and where they are currently standing. So that is the update for that article. And then in terms of our ongoing activities uh, relative to <clears throat> weapon GPO, um, there have been some, there's constantly activity happening on Capitol Hill on these issues. Not a week goes by where we don't have, you know, meetings, whether they be with members of Congress, their staff, members of our national coalition, everyone continues to work on trying to resolve this issue this year. And if you refer back to our January edition of The Voice, we had a very comprehensive article of the various proposals who has filed these different bills, the differences between the bills, along with our assessment of um, the, the probable outcome and, and how we see things developing throughout 2022. So I'm not going to revisit that um, at this point, and this article really doesn't re revisit that because those details haven't changed since our January newsletter. Um, the big change has come about internally on Capitol Hill with Congressman Neal's staff. Um, his chief of staff, um, Bill Trangisi, who had been with Congressman Neal um, for many years, um, stepped down. Um, he is going to the private sector. Uh, replacing him in the role of chief of staff um, is um, Lizzie O'Hara. And what makes this significant is Lizzie previously um, had been the deputy chief of staff and had been specifically assigned to work directly with us on the issues of Social Security WEP and GPO. Um, part of her request and the congressman's request of her being promoted to chief of staff was that she would continue uh, to lead the efforts internally on this issue. And what makes this significant is really for two reasons. One, it's rare that chiefs of staff on Capitol Hill um, continue to focus on individual issues. They're typically responsible for running the office, managing the staff, attending various meetings on behalf of, of their member. Um, they don't typically focus on one specific issue. Exceptions are made, however, when something rises to a level of great importance, as is the case with Weapon GPO. Um, as Congressman Neal has repeatedly said, these issues are as important to him as they are to us. Um, so the fact that he's kept his chief of staff on this issue um, is encouraging, it's important, and, important, and really it's a great um, cause for relief for us. Um, Lizzie has been a great partner. We would be really, it would be a step backwards to have this reassigned uh, to someone new who didn't have the background, who didn't, hadn't been involved um, to the level that Lizzie has been over the past um, eight years that she's been working with us on this issue. So um, it's a great relief. We're thankful for this. Um, and we're very hopeful that over the coming months, we can find a solution to this issue. And that solution most likely is gonna come in the form of a compromise 
uh, between Congressman Neal and Congressman Brady. And we are doing our part each and every day of working with our partners in Texas to help uh, broker that deal. Um, both sides have to be willing to give a little bit um, to, at the end of the day, provide some relief to our members. And we'll have more to say on this issue as new information um, develops down the road. But with that, um, I want to kick it over to Bill. Bill's been heavily focused, as all of us are, on health care. Um, he did a great job with this issue in terms of Medicare and explaining uh, some of the backgrounds of the Medicare Part B increase, what we're trying to do to provide some relief for all of you. Um, Bill, can you just give a little bit of insight on, on that particular story? Okay, I will, uh, Sean. I, I, for purposes of full disclosure, I am one of the ones, along with our listeners out there, viewers out there, that were impacted by the decision to increase the Part B premium by uh, $21.60 a month. And um, a lot of money. A lot of money. And it not only affected me, impacted me, but it impacted my wife, who's also impacted by the windfall. So, in a way, I have a lot of empathy to, with our members over what's happening out there. Now, in our November bulletin, um, we put, excuse me, our January bulletin, uh, we pointed out that they were in fact going to go raise the Part B premium up to $170.10 a month. We obviously took, we took uh, issue with that and, and asked our members to get a hold of their senators, their senators and their congressmen. And I, it, it appears that they heard heard you. You know, if you took a, took our took the advice that we gave you in suggestion and did in fact contact your congressman, they did. They are in fact looking at ways of reducing down the 2022 Part B premium that we're paying right now. Um, they're, they're had, the, the reason too uh, that they're doing this is that. As you saw in the January bulletin, Biogen, the manufacturer of the Alzheimer's medication, um, was suggesting an outrageous price for their drug. And because the feds were uncertain as to whether or not they would cover it, they did in fact go ahead as if they were. And a lot of that increase, that $21.60 is attributable to what Biogen's Alzheimer's medication. So now Biogen stepped back after the uproar that took place at the beginning last year, and now had cut the price in half. So again, you know, I don't have anything definitive in terms of uh, what they're gonna exactly do in terms of bringing about some relief from this, this incredible increase in, in Part B, but it does appear, all signs point to the fact that they are going to do something. No, I think that will be good and welcome news for our members and you know, as Bill mentioned, uh, Congresswoman Clark in particular has been very proactive on this issue. And, you know, beyond the fact that when we first reached out to, to her on this of getting right back to us, um, we've been provided um, with regular updates by her senior staff in terms of, of the developments here. So um, once there's some news to report, we'll make sure we get that back to everybody. Um, but oh, not only add, yep, sorry, go ahead, Bill. I was going to have one thing, that, that, that very point. I mean, you'll see it in your March bulletin that we say they are taking a look at what they're going to what they're going to do. Between now and our May bulletin, I would only suggest that you keep stay tuned. You know, there'll be it'll be either in weekly videos, it'll be on our website, um, it'll be on the hotline message. There's other ways, as you know, our members know, there's other ways for us to contact you between issues of the voice. So please just stay tuned because there's a good chance that that something may happen between now and our next issue of the, of the May issue of The Voice, which will be going out in April. And then Nancy, in terms of, of the budget, I know that the governor filed his budget right around the time we went to press. Um, it con contained the COLA. Can you just give an update of where that process is at? Yep, so uh, the governor files his budget uh, towards the, so we'll start the FY23 process. Uh, what ends up happening is it gets submitted to the House. Uh, the Ways and Means Committees end up holding hearings uh, on the various agencies and proposals that are included in the budget. His budget included the 3% COLA. Um, it also held the uh, premium splits at the GIC to their current splits, as well as fully funded the GIC. 
Um, <clears throat> so what ends up, what the next step in the process will be that the house will uh, release their version of the budget, uh, the, usually the week before April vacation. Um, and then when they come back from April vacation, they'll debate that. And then in May, the Senate will do their version. It will go to conference committee and all fingers crossed that we have a, a, a budget by June 30th so that it can start in July 1. Um, the last couple of years, it's been a little off with the pandemic and whatnot, but um, we've been kind of close to it. So that is the uh, how that process will work, flesh out over the next uh, several months. And we'll, we actually are planning, I believe, a town hall in April related to the budget process. So make sure you, you know, stay tuned for that and um, participate. That's right. And, and thank you for the reminder for that, Nancy. On Friday, April 29th, um, will be our town hall meeting. We're going to focus exclusively on our legislative package and most importantly, um, what took place in terms of the House budget. Um, we timed this upcoming um, April town meeting to coincide with the completion of, of the budget process in the House. So at least as the schedule stands now, um, because of the pandemic, the you know, schedule is a bit a bit fluid. Um, but as it stands now, we're anticipating that by the end of April, the House will have acted and, and we'll have some new news to report in that regard. Um, but Bill, in, in, in terms of COLAs, which of course is the big thing we're working with with the legislature here, um, we have a primary article that I believe you wrote for the newsletter about calculating COLAs and a little bit of the history of how the COLA has come to be, particularly at the federal level with the CPI. Um, provide a little bit of insight uh, on, on that story? Oh, yes, I will, uh, Sean. I, you know, as, as our members know that in addition to our role as an advocate, uh, we're also see our, our role as being an educator. And uh, if you're going to have a strong, united uh, group out there of retirees, they have to know what they're talking about. And that's part of the job that we, we, we take very seriously. And in the article that Sean's talking about, we look at really um, how it, how the uh, cola is arrived at. You know, the, the, the when we had the legislation enacted to allow locals, local retirement systems, to enact their own uh, uh, cola, and the state and teachers have theirs separately, um, we put, provided a mechanism for the um, for when what would trigger the determination of the cola. And, and what it was is that, that it required that we, we saw what the Social Security Administration was doing uh, in terms of the COLA for Social Security. And um, what the Social Security Administration does is they don't calculate their own COLA. They basically rely upon another federal agency, one that uh, doesn't get as much publicity. Um, and that's the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, which basically their job is to determine consumer price indexes. And it's one of those prices that is used to determine what the COLA is for our Social Security. And now we know that they made that determination last October. It was announced by Social Security. And for this year, for Social Security, the COLA is a 5.9% COLA. But again, this, the story was to give our members a better appreciation of, an understanding of how they come about that. And I hope that our members find it not only interesting, but also informative. But one last thing on that, Sean, we, were, we did point out that among the, uh, the consumer price indexes, there is some talk about creating one just strictly for um, retirees. Um, and actually there is one, but they don't publicize it. And the fact is that we think that maybe a CPI for retirees makes it a, a lot of sense because it would would focus more on the, the, the costs that, that retirees are facing, primarily healthcare. So again, Thanks, I hope, yeah, yeah, I I hope should, you find it very interesting. Yeah, and we actually have two, two related articles on, on the subject of, of the Kohler and Social Security. Um, on page 12, you'll find a chart detailing every um, cost of living in, increase under Social Security since 1975. And, you know, with inflation at a 40-year high right now, and um, you know, a lot of folks wondering, you know, how how has this come to be? Uh, we thought it would be helpful to give everything a little bit of context and, and just detail, you know, going back over 
really the majority of, of my lifetime. I'm 51. So in uh, July of 1975, I was not yet five years old, but a long time ago. But, you know, it's, it's just one of the things we always want to do is educate and inform and enlighten our members and others who read our newsletter um, of the historical perspective of things. Um, Nancy, in terms of our legislative platform, another thing that we've been trying to do with every edition of The Voice is highlight specific aspects of our legislative proposals. You know, we've spent a lot of time recently on the COLA. Um, we've talked about life insurance in depth in the past, um, the Medicare Part B issue. Can you talk a little bit about the, the veterans bills that we're highlighting in the current edition? Yep. So as you said, this edition has um, a spotlight on the legislation to improve the veterans bonus, as well as to extend the definition of a um, veteran for the vote for the bonus. Um, <clears throat> both pieces of legislation were released from the Committee on Public Service favorably. Um, so they are now moving on to the next step of the process. Um, the article gives you a summary of both pieces of legislation, as well as a little bit about the two sponsors of the House and Senate bills, Senator John Velas and uh, Representative Jerry Paracella, both who have been um, longtime supporters of the mass retirees and who um, have been filing the legislation for us um, for a couple of sessions now. Um, <clears throat> and we work very closely uh, with the two of them on these bills in particular. So, so that's what that article will provide a little bit of an update for, for folks and give some background on the, on the legislation. So two final points before we wrap up. And, and there are other articles in this newsletter that we, we've skipped over. Um, we'd be here for a full hour if we, if we detailed all of them. Um, you know, there's 20 pages in each newsletter and it's chock full of information. Um, hopefully you, you'll spend you know, the time to go through it. Reach out, let us know if you have, after reading you know, the articles, if you have specific questions or concerns, um, you can contact any of us. All of our um, personal contact information is on the back of your membership card, along with our weekly hotline number and uh, the number for our Teletown Halls. Um, but in addition to our advocacy and the membership services that we provide, um, we're also trying to provide enhanced benefits and whether they be uh, retiree discount programs um, like we offer through our partner, You Decide. And you'll find on pages 14 and 15 of the newsletter, um, an article about our partnership with You Decide, along with a a uh, dozen or more of their recent offerings um, that we find or that you may find of, of some interest. And you'll see in the article that from what we've been told from, from you decide, on an annual basis, um, more than 700 of our members engage with you decide on, on various uh, discounts. Uh, one of the more popular discounts has been the um, General Electric um, product discount that they offer. So these are, are discounts that are available exclusively um, to Mass Retirees members. You'll find all of that information on pages 14 and 15. Um, another program that we have been working on for quite some time now, for the last couple of years, has been the creation of a Mass Retirees license plate here in Massachusetts. And I'm very pleased to say that we're almost at the point where we can move forward uh, with developing the plate with the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Um, one of the thresholds that we need to, to achieve um, before we can move forward is we need 750 retirees or individuals um, who have confirmed that they are in fact interested in purchasing one of these plates if they were to be available. Um, now, I should point out that you have to register your vehicle in Massachusetts. Uh, the plate has to go on an actual motor vehicle. Uh, I mention this because some members have reached out thinking it would be a great collector's item, and it, it would be, um, but these are actual license plates for, for real vehicles here in Massachusetts, and um, you know that's the requirement of our RMV that has to go on an actual car or other vehicle. Um, but if you are interested, if you haven't contacted us already and you're interested in um, you know, ordering a, a mass retirees plate, all of the information on is on page 13 
of the newsletter, uh, reach out to our office. Um, Tricia will add you to the list. And then we're, we're I think, within a, a few dozen people of being able to move forward with, with the RMV finally. So um, if you've already registered, thank you so much. It will be very exciting um, to see a mass retirees plate on vehicles around Massachusetts or in other parts of the country with our snowbirds. Um, but with that, I just want to see if Nancy and Bill have anything further to add or. Well, the only thing I would add, Sean, briefly is that I hope everybody enjoys reading their March issue. We're working already on the May one. Yep. And that leads me to ask if, if you have any ideas out there for stories, uh, please, what, please contact us and let us know. Our typical bulletin has around 16 stories. And I think, you know, this particular one, the March one has, I think might be right on the button, might be 16 stories. So, it, you know, we're, we wanna have a, a broad spectrum of issues that are impacting retirees. You know, the highlight, the important issues, yes. But then there's other ones like Sean pointed out that we we, we present in our, uh, publish in our bulletin. So again, if you have any ideas, just email us, call us up, send us a letter, whatever way works for you so that uh, you know, we can take a look at it. I can't promise you uh, that we'll do anything with it, but it, yeah, that, that's always very helpful to us. So with that shot, I turn it back to you. Now, Bill, that's a great point. And I wanna extend that invitation as well to our, our partners um, within the retirement community. You know, our newsletter and, and these videos and our weekly messages you know, aren't just received by our membership, um, they also serve as a service to the public officials who are responsible for the management and the administration and the investing of your monies, um, along with the folks on Beacon Hill who are you know, creating the policies and the laws that drive all of this. So um, for any of you listening, if you know of something or you have an idea for us, something we should focus on, you know, reach out to Nancy or Bill or myself or Frank or Tommy Bonarigo, um, and we'll see what we can do to make that happen. Uh, Nancy, anything? You, I'll give you the last words. <laughs> nope, I'm good. I'm good on my end. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much. This has been a long, um, a long weekly video, but I, I hope you found it informative. And we'll be back to you again next week um, for our last update of Friday, or last last update of February, which will occur on a Friday. Thank you again, everybody. Bye bye.